even something that was a healthy getting over, because that was a very predominant way of thinking about it as well. Instead, it increasingly became regarded as a problematic refusal or inability to do so. It became symptomatic of some kind of underlying sickness. Now, that shift, which I'm presenting to sketchily here, could also be seen um, more widely elsewhere in Germany. And it was part of wider ways of seeing and talking about, uh, that were fundamental. Ah, Peter's whizzing. I'm trying to be technologically advanced. Um, fundamental to a massive wave of commemoration and museum building. Now, in the recent article, what I did was I took a look since then um, to other cases and countries to suggest that this shift could be seen and had even become accepted to such an extent that it could be said to amount to what I called a fundamental, though far from universal, change underway in how national identity is performed in relation to troubling pasts. So increasingly, I suggested, owning up to problems of, and perpetration in the nation's own history had come to be accepted and perhaps even expected as a way of performing contrition and political trustworthiness. The escalation of numbers of political apologies, where one nation um, officially apologises to another for past uh, wrongs, be it the Irish potato famine or the Japanese use of comfort women in World War II, is another instance of, of that. But let me just give a couple of very brief examples uh, in relation to um, World War II history and its representation in museums. Um, take the case of France. As various scholars have pointed out, uh, representation of World War II um, for a long time tended to be rather heroic, focusing on resistance. But there seemed to be signs of that changing. A more notable example was the exhibition um, Collaboration, oh, I'm speaking, speaking German now, um, I'm sticking it in one language, I'm sticking it in English. Uh, there's this exhibition about um, collaboration at the um, French National Archives, so at a, a, a major uh, uh, place. And that opened in December of, of 2014. Now, while, while such acknowledgement wasn't entirely new, Previously, examples were often subject to degrees of what I've uh, called and discussed in the article of containment. That is, that the kind, of, a kind of playing down that goes along with, at the same time, mentioning. So, um, so that the full impact or the full implications might not be really taken on board. So, for example, something like collaboration might. Uh, be mentioned just in passing or depicted as a minor issue, um, perhaps that just of a few fanatics. But in this exhibition, um, collaboration is depicted as extensive through all social layers, and not only because people were forced into it uh, by the Nazi occupiers. Rather, the exhibition showed how many subscribed to the Nazi ideology and that they did so, moreover, as part of their identity as French, rather than in contradiction uh, of it. Um, let's take Austria. Um, now, again, there's been considerable scholarship showing the long-standing reluctance to move from self-depiction as an innocent uh, victim of German invasion and... Uh, and as a subject, a, a, a subject occupied nation. As in the case of Poland, however, historians and other researchers and artists have challenged this. Indeed, this has been done uh, by some of those uh, here in this, in this room. Take the work uh, done by the MemScreen uh, project, uh, based at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, where a whole string of significant projects has been uh, conducted which couple research into forgot forgotten or marginalised histories um, and have created innovative means 
uh, of representing them to wider publics. So as one example, the 2015 exhibition, uh, Tell It to Your Children, National Socialism in One's Own Family, um, is a good example uh, of this. So opened at uh, Graz's Cultural Centre, it's about artists uh, Friedemann Derschnitt's own family, but at the same time more widely about what he describes as, and I quote, the complex web of myths, legends, and lies about the past. But how much further does this go? Is there also a pulse at a more established level here in Austria? Well, I think I should probably leave that to some others uh, here in this uh, audience, and we could add that to the debate. Um, but let me just add one example. Uh, well, actually, it'll turn into more than one, maybe. Um, one example to the debate. Um, and that's a series of exhibitions that was uh, created by Urbe Bay, Austria's national railway company. Um, exhibitions are called Verdrängte Jahre, Bahn und Nationalsozialismus in Österreich 1938 bis 1945. Uh, or in English, the suppressed years. Um, based on considerable historical research uh, funded by the railway company, um, these were shown at various places in 2014, um, including uh, in Brussels at the European, um, the European Parliament, um, but also here, at the Kenter Landesmuseum in Klagenfurt. And people can tell me if that really is the picture from there. Um, it seemed to be online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the exhibition showed the company's own role in supporting Nazi actions, um, including um, in transporting Jews uh, to concentration camps, as well as detailing some examples of resistance. Now, in some ways, it's surely rather remarkable that a company would do that, um, especially given that the current company could uh, argue that it isn't the same uh, entity as that uh, during the war. But as the company's uh, CEO, its head, uh, explained, and I, I quote, uh, some of our marketing team feared that it would hurt the brand. But his view, however, and that was the one that prevailed, was that the contrary was the case. And what he said was, but we needed the brand to be clean. <laughs> and showing what happened in the Holocaust is necessary for that. So in a world of companies competing uh, also for European and sometimes for global business, and also in the, fan, in the face of demands for restitution payments uh, for forced labour, forced labour during the war, and uh, Urbe Bay has, has, has faced... Uh, those. Being proactive about showing one's honourable credentials is a good move. Creating an exhibition about one's past, then, serves as a kind of symbolic sign of cleanliness in a broader willingness to come clean and therefore to be trustworthy. Well, we could therefore view such developments, um, those kinds of acknowledging of difficult heritage, a bit cynically. Well, there are cases that certainly could prompt quite a cynical um, interpretation. So when in December 2014, the French National Rail Railway Company, SNCF, don donated uh, $4 million um, in the US uh, for um, Holocaust museums, memorials and education programs uh, over, over five years, um, it did so as part of its restitution uh, for forced labour settlement. Um, moreover, had it not done so, 
it would have been ineligible to compete for rail contracts in the US. So it was part of the kind of deal to be allowed to do that. But while that last example does show a very clear utilitarian and commercial motive for coming clean, I think it would be wrong to reduce uh, too much to that. Um, even when we're dealing with companies and the establishment. When at the opening of the Urbe Bay exhibition in Brussels, a member of the European Parliament stated, um, wir wollen aus der Geschichte lernen für eine friedliche europäische Perspektive. Uh, we want to learn for, um, from history for a peaceful European perspective. We could hear this as just a familiar cliché. But that, I think, would fail to recognise how grappling with these pasts, pasts that did tear Europe apart, has become a means of thinking about how evil that poisons relations between people can happen at everyday levels, can happen within organisations, even such organisations as a railway company. And clichéd though those words are, like many other clichés, they also do speak to some kinds of banal truths and of a need to find ways to live peacefully across divides and differences within Europe. Well, the move towards acknowledging um, difficult heritage does then come from many places and interests, um, as I hope I've managed to at least indicate in, in part. And it's certainly a work in progress. So while my article suggested that there was by now a coalition of so many drivers towards addressing difficult heritage, perhaps even making not doing so feel like an active evasion, I did also point out that this is extremely uneven subject to containment and even backlash. Sometimes such moves are cynical, but they are also often inspired by genuine wishes to grapple with the legacy of horrible pasts and to remember and reflect upon these in order to help create more self-aware and open societies. How to do this, though, remains a challenge. The conventional exhibition format, as in the Urbe Bay case, maybe that's a better picture to show in this bit, that's one possibility. But we know that it only reaches so many people and that for some, and maybe especially for younger audiences, that the very format, those black and white photographs and panels that look like textbook information, that these can make it seemed more distant and less relevant as history. Under certain formats and formulations settle into cliché, we need to find other ways of conveying not just the information, but also the messages that we wish to take from the past and convey to the present and to future generations. So, in this talk, I focused on the representation of World War II and Holocaust, but there are, of course, many other contentious heritages in Europe, the socialist and Cold War past, that of colonialism, Islamic heritage, the heritage of migrants and refugees, and of many uh, other sorts that are just some of the uh, many uh, kinds of problematic pasts that require thinking carefully about today. So what they need is in-depth, careful research, and that means research into archives, into sources of various sorts, those of companies, those of private individuals, official records, personal diaries, and more. It also means in-depth research with people today, people who have some kind of entanglement in those histories who see it in some way or other as part of their memory and heritage. And it means research into what kinds of lines of connection can be drawn between past and present. How can we draw on some histories 
to help us to understand the, pr the present and the possibilities for the future. What's more, it also needs exploration of ways of making those connections in ways that will speak effectively to broader and diverse publics. It needs ways of making the past present that go beyond cliches, that make audiences look anew and afresh, that enable them to understand, um, to enable them to be interested in the past and to draw new lines of recognition into the present and future. Well, along with other colleagues, I'm here in Klagenfurt today uh, for this kick-off meeting that we've, we've been kicking off all day. Um, <laughs> kicking off uh, a new multi-country European research project that's been mentioned. So Traces, Transmitting Contentious Cultural Heritage with the Arts. Um, this three-year uh, Horizon 2020 uh, project led by Klaus Schoenberger here in Klagenfurt and bringing together this team from 10 uh, different countries. So the aim of that project is precisely to grapple with questions of contentious heritage. Uh, contentious heritage of a wide range of kinds, including that of World War II and Holocaust, but also other kinds, including other con conflicts, colonial, migrant, religiously framed, and so on. In doing so, it proposes new ways of tackling the transmission of contentious cultural heritage. And that is to involve the arts, but to do so in ways that go beyond some of those kind of short-term installation works that's been typical of much memory intervention so far, and which so often uh, centers upon the figure of the individual artist. Instead, what's planned in traces, as those of us here have heard lots of time, uh, times already today, but as some have just uh, come in, um, what's planned in Traces is to work together over longer periods of time, bringing together research and artistic endeavour, and a range of those who sometimes get called stakeholders, we need a nicer word for that, um, including cultural institutions, to collaboratively explore and create new ways uh, of engaging. That is, to find traces in the past, to redraw lines into the present, to create new spaces of debate, not just for now, but also into the future. And I'm really, really looking forward to working with uh, colleagues here uh, on that, and to those who've come now, just watch the traces space. Thank you very much. questions too and perhaps it uh, will be possible to have another five or ten minutes uh, for questions uh, to our correspondent scientist Sharon McCormick, please. People are too hungry. <laughs> yes, thank you very much uh, Sharon. This was a most uh, inspiring uh, Inspiring uh, lecture. I have one uh, question, so perhaps we can provide food for thought for us. And I'm also thinking of how we work with such issues uh, in traces. You've shown us with the example of Poland as it were the biographical, if you think of a nation in terms of a biography, the mm -hmm. biographical contradictions, as it were, between resistance and anti-Semitism and how they can be played out. But what I find also interesting, and I wonder how you think one might investigate this in projects, how such biographical contradictions 
play out um, for the individual, you see, and for individual research subjects and for research subjects who are left long past, as it were, uh, deceased. Uh, and I can only think of, as it were, from high culture, the arts and philosophy, that we all know, of course, of people who are still, as it were, are on the canon of our teaching and so forth. And we have very interesting texts from them. Martin Heidegger, uh, Ezra Pound, Knut Hansen, and so forth, who all at a certain point in their lives and their careers had been, and this is just one example, committed Nazis, as other people in the past might have been racists or colonialists, uh, but they too earned Nobel mm -hmm. Prizes or other thing. So I wonder that on the lesser known individuals where there might have been also such contradictions between perhaps some good deeds in their lives and other things much despicable, uh, how we investigate those. Uh, because cases might not be always clear cut. Yeah. Should yeah. we collect a uh, question or what would you like? Uh, I haven't got a good memory. Uh, okay, then we <laughs> to do with working on memory, I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you say? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it's. I mean, there's a lot in that question of different things that one could um, investigate. I guess a really interesting dimension is what, why that in particular. I mean, it, it strikes me that if we're thinking about these questions of contentious heritage, those kinds of contradictions are very interesting, and maybe they're ones people can then. I don't know, identify with more the struggles rather than... I mean, I think a big problem in a, a lot of ways of uh, presenting um, the Nazi past in particular, that is what I've looked at, is it just simply falls into the oh, good and bad. And that makes it very, very easy for um, uh, audiences to go, well, those are the baddies and, you know, then there were good guys. I, I'd rather be a good guy kind of thing. Um, but the, when you really see the struggles of what people were doing and maybe shifting, maybe, you know, that's, that's very important. I mean, I think the, the, there absolutely is good historical work using things like diaries and looking. I mean, there's, there's more and more work on not just the big famous uh, people. But I think it's really important, absolutely, though, yeah. Yes, um, I really like um, when you announce some different um, contentious cultural heritage like um, the Islam and the Cold War. And I was wondering because all those events, they are already in the past and they are quite like finished. No? They are the, like um, the peak mm. is, is in the past. So I was wondering if uh, like the neoliberal system, for example, would this also be like, is it possible to name it as a contentious cultural, cultural heritage? Because it's still like the peak, we are in the middle of it, so I was wondering. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens. I mean, it's contentious, that's for sure. Yeah, um, yeah I'm just thinking what comes if we do. Yeah, well, I think... Uh, one could have a very, very interesting exhibition for a start on that topic. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the way that I think about cultural heritage, which I, I work with a very expanded kind of idea of it, which is, yeah, but maybe we wouldn't want neoliberalism, um, which is the particular kinds of uh, past that people work with and are trying to push something into the future, so then I probably wouldn't want to define it in that way. Um, yeah, but I mean, just on the other point, I mean, I think saying that some things are of the past, I mean, the debates about Islam are absolutely present currently, for example, um, and what, Cold War past, there's an awful lot that's very, very present um, as well. But yeah, we should talk about that one over beer, I think. Mario <laughs> Hunt? Not me. Okay. Um, thank you, Sharon, for this very 
differentiate its presentation about um, contentious cultural heritage. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you, you asked this question, is difficult heritage difficult in Europe still? And it's really interesting, um, back in the 80s, Klaus and I were involved in the history workshop movement, mm -hmm. and in um, 88 was the 40th um, anniversary of the, uh, the so-called Reichsgesteinacht, the pogrom in Germany against <coughs> uh, synagogues um, all over Germany. And so it was the 40th anniversary, and suddenly it was possible to speak about it wasn't called the Holocaust then in Germany, in non-Jewish Germany. It was memory of the Nazi past. Mm -hmm. But suddenly it was all over the place. It was 88, it was almost 98, no, it was 88. So it was um, suddenly a topic that was possible to talk about in the media. Um, there were um, official speeches um, acknowledging the victims, not only the Jewish victims, but a lot of, you know, gypsies, um, well, you shouldn't say gypsies, women. Um, 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 homosexuals, all sorts of different people. Um, and we thought about that critically, and we called it, um, you know, in Germany the, the, the discourse was always, you have to draw a line. At some point mm -hmm. you've got to draw a line. And we thought maybe this line has softened, and we have a soft, we have drawn a soft line in Germany, which is about speaking an awful lot and having projects and funding for projects and exhibitions and media articles, interviews and all that stuff. So um, I think the, the question I would ask you is, um, in traces we have talked a lot about a different European imagination, a heritage based on solidarity and understanding and all that. It sounds a bit like what you quoted the ÖBB as saying, <laughs> you want to learn from history. And, um, but when I think about the possibility, you know, if I say, let's keep the sting, let's keep it painful, let's make it painful, who am I to say that um, as, a, as an academic, but also as a person? So what do we want? Do we have to make a decision whether we want to go for reconciliation and peace and solidarity? Do we have to make a decision between that and, on the other hand, keeping painful memories painful? and allowing maybe sometimes silence as well. I don't know. Can you maybe translate that into a proper response? <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question to ask, and I don't think there's a single answer. I think all the cases, the moments, what's going on, I mean, you can't do it simply the whole time. Yeah. It's yeah. maybe too much, um, but equally, the, I mean, I think part of it is who is hurt when you stop remembering and talking and what are the possible outcomes of that. So you're thinking about uh, those kinds of issues. But I think, I think what Klaus was saying in his lecture earlier was really very um, relevant and right on that, that, you know, the, um, the, the stopping things getting too settled. Um, so I'm, I'm putting it r wrongly, but whatever you said was absolutely right this morning. <laughs> so, um, so I don't think there's a single a answer. Um, and I mean, what we see is different kinds of histories and groups and so on sort of come to the mm -hmm. fore, and then that often then creates a sort of remembering of others who may be marginalised. I think it's always going to just keep moving like that, really. Not the one who makes it longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, last chance, last question. Okay, there is the material side comes <laughs> overwhelm us. So, um, I would like to thank you once more for coming and for help giving this public lecture. And um, I think we have a lot of thinking, a lot of discussion materials to go on the next two days and thank you for coming here and thank you once more to show you. Thank you.